Hello and welcome to the Economic Times Pharma Leaders Roundtable. It is my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Economic Times to this live webinar on the future of Indian pharmaceuticals and what the COVID outbreak means for the industry. Today we have congregated to witness leading luminaries of the Indian pharma industry deliberate upon the major challenges facing the sector and how the pandemic has brought seismic shifts in the industry. The disruptive forces triggered by the pandemic were equally cruel to the pharma industry as they were to other sectors. Several aspects of pharma value chain from manufacturing to sales and marketing is adapting to dynamic changes. In fact, working practices across the industry may never be the same again. The lingering new normal might very well be the trigger that finally compels the risk averse pharma industry to fully embrace new technology by overcoming the hurdles of legacy systems, regulations, and compliance. Adoption of digital technologies is creating havoc across India Inc. and pharma cannot be an exception. Digital tech will play a crucial role in ensuring that India's pharma industry continues to function to the best of its abilities. The industry will also need, address, need to address supply chain issues that emerged during the pandemic. Despite the challenges, the fact remains that the pharma industry is a jewel in India's crown with tremendous long-term growth opportunities. It has the potential to spur India's journey towards Atmanevata. And to enlighten us about how this critical goal can be achieved, we have with us today, Mr. Karan Singh. Karan Singh is the Managing Director of ACG, a future-ready solutions provider to the pharma industry. In recent years, Karan has steered ACG from an Indian business into a world-renowned institution, working with 60 of the top 100 global pharmaceuticals and nutraceutical giants. Karan has been a leading proponent of adopting new technologies to help provide quality, safe, and affordable medicines, as well as to optimize and secure supply chain. Passionate about converting ideas into growth opportunities, Karan takes a keen interest in creating entrepreneurial visions that solve real world challenges. He's an investor, mentor to 30 plus health tech startups, guiding them on strategy, technology, expertise, and network. Karan also serves on the India Advisory Board for the India-Brazil Chamber of Commerce and is the co-chair for FICCI LSE Regional Council. Today, Karan will enlighten us about the future of Indian pharmaceuticals in the post-COVID era. Over to you, Karan. Thank you, and a very good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. For me, this is the first industry event of 2021. Uh, I heartily thank the Economic Times for organizing such a stellar panel, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion. But before we move forward, a quick look back. Many of our friends and family talk about 2020 as a year to forget. We reset our lives to accommodate each other's extended work hours, we managed managing ambiguity. Some of us lost loved ones and the threat to incomes and jobs was palpable. I could go on about the physical and emotional upheaval. Instead, I want to focus on what it taught us and how we emerged stronger and smarter, a better version of ourselves. In 2020, we learned to appreciate each other a lot more. Even though we connected virtually, we had more meaningful conversations and got to know each other better than ever before. Secondly, we learned to learn. We invested in upgrading our skills, be it webinars, virtual conferences, or online courses. A vast majority of us learned something new every few days. CXOs across most sectors struggled as revenues fell off the cliff. Supply chain came to a grinding halt and staff was locked down, making what I call just-in-case scenarios part of everyday planning. We learned that none of us are insulated from a crisis in life or at work. These lessons in agility, leadership, and compassion 
have changed us forever. Most importantly, 2020 taught us the value of our health and well being. Keeping minds and bodies fit became priority, even for those of us who traditionally ignored health at the altar of our careers. Families found healthier recipes, regular exercise became the norm, and returned to the roots, yoga became fashionable with the new, in, the new India. The pandemic has been an expensive lesson and we have paid for it with more than money. To generate maximum returns on these lessons, it is important to reflect and make them a part of our strategy and practices before we go back to our old ways. Thus, it is my great pleasure to dialogue with you today on the future of Indian pharmaceuticals in the post-COVID era. For us in the healthcare segment, IT adoption skyrocketed in 2020 as hospitals, health systems, and patients increasingly relied on digital health technologies for care delivery during the pandemic, setting the stage for continued growth and innovation in 2021. With COVID, we have witnessed global disruptions, instabilities, and supply chain breakdowns, as one would expect during World War II. This, along with heightened customer demand for digital first experiences, is speeding the fourth industrial revolution forward. While the pandemic continues to drive significant uncertainty, now manufacturers are revamping their growth strategies with a renewed appreciation of how operating models determine outcomes. I was reading a post that Vikas shared that maximizing productivity is no longer enough. I, and I agree. To support any hope of lasting competitive advantage, we must achieve more than ever before. Each of our businesses needs stronger resilience, faster innovation, higher customer satisfaction, and more engaged workforces. And all this needs to happen all at once. Digital transformation is not easy. When we talk about sustainable, digitally infused future for any business, it is not possible without the use of Industry 4.0 technologies like IoT, artificial intelligence, machine learning. However, it is a tall order. Having personally been involved in the process, I can say that integrating even one production line with the Internet of Things in our factory was a challenging and learning process. Despite several cases, case studies available, we were still walking on uncharted territory. <clears throat> I can confidently say that the companies, including ACG, that have an edge today, took bold steps to embrace agility and innovation. Integrating transformative fourth industrial revolution technologies across multiple facets of their operations. To end, the fourth industrial revolution is no longer a hype. It's fully here. Enabling real gains in productivity, sustainability, agility, and speed to market. I believe three C's of pharma manufacturing will drive the next wave of innovation and growth. Continuous manufacturing in pharma will bring down losses and inefficiencies from the traditional batch production process. And remote monitoring and compliance will be centered via technology. To talk to you about some of these trends and what we are doing here, I would like to inv invite Mr. Balaji Kasiram. Thank you for listening to me. Over to you, Bala. Thank you, Karan. Good evening, everybody. So Karan spoke about how uh, digital technology can enable improving competitive advantage and resilience. So I'm going to walk you through a very short presentation on what ACG is doing in this space. So uh, in ACG, we look at uh, digital transformation under four broad brackets. The first is about operations. So how can digital enable enhancing operations, be it improving OE, reducing cost of goods sold, reducing lead times. The next bucket that we speak about is how do we make our products smarter? So ACG manufactures a variety of machines. So how can we connect continuously to the machines. So how do we understand how they operate? What kind of insights that can be given to customers to reduce down times and also look at the operational data and enhance the design of our machines. The third important area is customer experience. 
we interact with a variety of customers across multiple touch points so how do we leverage technology to ensure that a seamless customer experience is provided to our customers the fourth big area is how can we create new business models leveraging digital so of these four areas today we are developing and deploying solutions in these three areas operations products and customer service so if you see here we just uh, depicted the digital initiatives that we are in the process of developing and deploying across the value chain the light blue ones are about smart products and services which is about our connected machines where we are leveraging industrial iot machine learning and advanced analytics to connect to our machines and understand and analyze and provide insights the range of initiatives in operations that's where we started and then we focusing and taking baby steps with respect to customer experience especially in the area of service how can we use augmented reality based technologies to enhance service and effect more about these initiatives in the next slides we'll start with smart manufacturing so this was this was the first one we started Uh, in our plants so more than 500 machines are connected across our plants uh, we are getting a variety of data with respect to process energy uh, fault data machine operational data more than 15000 parameters are connected so this is using a variety of industrial iot technologies so we do uh, several analysis starting from basic descriptive analytics to advanced analytics machine learning and computer vision to derive insights to enhance the operations so this has given us significant benefits with respect to uh, energy consumption we have sizably optimized the energy consumption uh, did a variety of downtime analysis and enhanced oe first pass yield was improved significantly a lot of defects were detected in real time wherein we improved the product quality so this was one of the first initiatives and uh, this is going in a very good manner we also use quite a bit of uh, mobile robotics we use uh, packaging automation agv and automatic storage and retrieval systems to optimize uh, the operations when it comes to finished goods and packaging so this has helped us in streamlining our operation significantly and reduce operation costs so we are in the process of implementing electronic batch management records i know uh, looking at traceability and genealogy in real time across the manufacturing process so with respect to the assisted operations we use augmented reality where we give very visual and contextual instructions to operators especially when we are changing batches and doing line clearance so these are some of the initiatives in the smart manufacturing area then we get to the connected machines which is the smart connected products so here acg manufactures a variety of machines for the pharma industry so here we are connecting to our machines wherein we acquire data process data condition data alarms alerts faults more than 300 parameters are acquired in every machine so then there's a good amount of compute that happens at the machine level itself wherein certain analysis and insights are derived in real time and then the data is um, sent to the iot platform which is on the cloud so where we look at ingesting this data in real time storing and doing a variety of analysis on it so where we can derive insights with respect to how the machine is performing vis-a-vis -vis how it should be understand failures breakdowns and provide insights to customers also in the process understand how our machines are running so are we over designing our machine can something be done to optimize the machine so this is a quick view of what we are doing with respect to the smart connected products next we have a variety of business data across our systems you know customer data sales data sourcing data logistics finance so we have created an enterprise data lake to get data from all these siloed systems store this data perform analysis and derive insights to understand what is happening to the enterprise as a whole and what kind of uh, initiatives can be done to improve the performance so we have taken very small baby steps in the digital journey even these small baby steps have given us significant business value in these particular areas with respect to oe uh, improving quality for pass yield defect reduction significantly enhancing on time deliveries to customers 
So there's a long journey ahead for digital. Uh, the future is looking very bright and the future is digital. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, a quick overview of uh, what we are doing in the digital space. That's all, Balaji, or you want to continue? That's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Balaji and Karan, for such an enticing and enriching session. It's time to move on to our next segment where industry veterans will reveal how their organizations responded to the pandemic induced disruptions and shared their stories of organizational transformation. For the Economic Times Pharma Leaders Roundtable on a very important subject, how COVID-19 has changed global healthcare and what the outbreak means for the industry, we have with us today an esteemed panel, Sanjeev Navankul, Managing Director and CEO, Bharat Serums and Vaccines, Arvind Kukreti, Deputy Drug Collector, Drug Central Drug Standard Central Control, CDSCO, Karan Singh, Managing Director, ACG, Omar Sharif Mohammed, Managing Director, Rashi Diabetes Care India, Prashant Nagre, Chief Executive Officer, Fermenta Biotech, Anand K, Chief Executive Officer, SRL, Vikas Badodia, Senior Partner, McKenzie and Company, Vikrant Shrotriya, Managing Director and Corporate Vice President, Novo Nordisk. The session will be moderated by Vikas Dandekar, Editor, Pharma and Healthcare, The Economic Times. Hello and welcome, gentlemen. Hello and welcome, gentlemen. Over to you, Vikas. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Rai Kishori. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, sparing your time, uh, you know, for this very important panel discussion. And it's been a, a, a plan for uh, quite a long time. And it's so good to see all of you, uh, especially very impressed uh, by the presentation that we have uh, from the ACG uh, group. And uh, Karan and uh, <coughs> Bala, thanks for, uh, you know, setting the tone for this uh, important discussion. So when uh, Rai Kishori mentioned that, you know, it's a uh, industry veterans, I didn't count myself in it. So, uh, you know, uh, basically, what we will be trying to do in the next uh, one hour uh, mm, is to try to understand exactly where things have changed. We've been hearing over the last 12 months about a big change that is happening in the healthcare and the disruptions that the pandemic has brought in. And when Karan mentioned about uh, the world's world, world war and industrial revolution, uh, that actually shows, you know, the kind of uh, the change that uh, has happened, uh, you know, in, in terms of the disruptions that the pandemic has brought in. So, uh, you know, we have about uh, 60 minutes of discussion. Uh, uh, we'll try to be as crisp as possible and, uh, you know, uh, brief in our comments, uh, you know, just to enable uh, maximum discussions happening. And uh, uh, to remind uh, our uh, distinguished panelists, we will be having some questions thrown in from our audiences also, and uh, I'll try to get into the Q&A box uh, as intermittently as possible so that I can uh, kind of pick and choose and put the questions to each of you. So with that kind of a uh, setting, uh, uh, here I see a, a, a diverse range of uh, experts, and uh, I would uh, kind of lean on each of your expertise in the sectors that you represent. Uh, Mr. Navangul, he, he is a veteran in, in global companies, now steering a very ambitious project, Bharat Serums. Uh, you know, no one orders, Krosh, uh, represented by Omar uh, Vikrant, has just uh, about, I think, uh, two years or so, you've taken over from Melvin. So, uh, and of course, I mean, we don't see regulators participating. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Kukreti, for giving your time. Uh, you know, you must be having a busy time with your, uh, you know, vaccine uh, approval processes. So uh, special thanks to you for making time. 
and uh, anand also i looked you up i haven't uh, met you or spoken to you so after apollo you've uh, uh, moved to srl so there also is a is a rich experience uh, ferment uh, uh, prashant you mentioned about your uh, credentials and the company that you represent so well so the diverse uh, nature of this uh, panel will probably be extremely enriching for our audiences and uh, you know help somewhere in reaching some good strategies and decisions so with that setting uh, i would uh, move to uh, vikas my name sake and uh, much 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 more uh, experienced uh, having worked so closely with the pharma companies and giving them solutions uh, what exactly do you think uh, vikas is uh, happening in in the healthcare paradigm i mean from the global perspective everything seems to have kind of tumbled Yeah. and uh, as you rightly pointed in one of your notes is about on the other side of the tunnel so what exactly do you see happening from here on i think uh, what we are witnessing is a human tragedy of huge size and scale right i think current referred to sort of world war and you know um, industrial revolution i mean this is something unprecedented in terms of human impact that it is having but for a second if we can kind of move on from that and think about the business i think the pharma industry in particular needed a jolt like this to kind of really get moving on some things that you know honestly the industry was not willing to move on i mean it is amazing how digital has been leveraged in the front end by different players all of you right in different panels we've talked about it right i mean everybody had those business cases everybody had those ideas already but it needed a trigger to really move on and suddenly one fine day when sort of the sales force couldn't go out there and meet the xcps um everybody scrambled right and from a what we call a digital denial state to kind of fast adoption of digital kind of it happened overnight right so i think there is a move that happened that was driven by the pandemic from sort of what we call legacy state to a little bit of a survival right initial reaction first few months how do we get going but i think the survival state forced companies to kind of really prioritize and see what matters right and also demonstrated how decision making can be so much faster than it was ever before and i think as a result of this what i'm most hopeful about is that we don't go back now to that legacy state right and we kind of settle somewhere in between which is a more resilient faster decision making more efficient organization and state of operating model right yeah so uh, as you rightly said i mean it required a jolt for the industry to change uh, but part of which probably was already happening so far as the digital side is concerned because i mean of course it's been catalyzed by the by the by the sheer uh, magnitude of this pandemic uh, but in terms of future technology some part of digitization actually helped because you know some 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 basic groundwork had already happened uh like uh, you know um, the e prescriptions or online pharmacies uh i think that probably helped uh, in in terms of uh, wading through those uh, absolute challenging situations i mean some of the records that i had seen was like about uh, how rural uh, prescriptions was actually uh, happening so you know tremendously uh on that uh, uh, would uh, uh, you know omar uh, or uh, vikrant want to come in because uh, i mean both of you have some kind of a you know association with diabetes uh, of course i mean that's again something that is called as a hidden pandemic but any thoughts that you all uh, maybe starting with omar and then i can toss it across to vikrant want to share on exactly how prescriptions worked and where exactly did you see these kind of changes happening Yeah. Thanks uh, thanks Vikas for this question and uh, before I get to how things were happening I think on the front of diabetes we definitely need to understand what did actually covid do and Vikas uh, was right in saying it actually gave us a jolt <laughs> and the outbreak of covid-19 has actually posed or posed several new challenges to us in the industry and has also provided an opportunity to transform the treatment for the patients now in in diabetes we saw during the lockdowns it caused by the coronavirus they turned the lives of people everywhere yet for those living with diabetes the movement restrictions 
had raised a whole series of extra questions, like how can they seek advice, how can their health be monitored, and how can they continue to manage their condition. And because of the drastic containment and mitigation measures, people with diabetes found themselves without necessary services. And this has been disrupting uh, the, the entire practice for preventing diabetes-related complications. However, because I would have to say that the government bodies, and you would also notice that uh, healthcare professionals uh, and those who supported people with diabetes have rallied really, really well during this pandemic time and, and found innovative ways of helping out. Now, you know, to be honest with you, looking ahead, I believe that technology will play a greater role in diabetes treatment and management. Once things ease out, uh, particularly through advances in medical applications that you see today, devices linked to smartphone and tablets and, and, and computers and the cameras, a lot of what happens can be delivered through technology enabled approaches. Whether that's through uploading symptoms, weight, blood pressure or blood sugar meter re readings from home so that the healthcare professionals along with the patients can take uh, you know, um, uh, informed decisions. Now, the last part is in the modern world today, technology still governs almost every aspect of our lives. And because you're right, we saw four trends coming up. Uh, one of them was, of course, the e-pharmacy. The other one was telemedicine. And we saw them growing to the tune of more than uh, 500 percent. And, and when that happened, we also saw that there was an equal distribution between the rural as well as the, the cities that we live in. There was a 44 percent contribution of e-pharmacies as well as teleconsultation, even in non, uh, uh, you know, kind of urban cities. So, so that, that made a lot out of it. And with the development of advanced technologies, uh, social media, and most of it out there, I think uh, this will change quite a bit. And uh, during this global pandemic, remote patient monitoring has emerged as a very effective and sustainable solution um, uh, for precaution, prevention, and treatment to stem the spread of COVID-19. Uh, and, and that telemedicine is here to stay with us. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it uh, ends exactly where Vikrant can take over uh, because, you know, your association with uh, diabetes has been so strong for so many years. Uh, over to you, Vikrant. Thank you, Vikas. I will, in fact, pick up the point from you that uh, is it something which has uh, not started or is it something which has just come because of the COVID and it was a complete denial stage when it comes to pharmaceutical industry? I would say that uh, there was a change which was happening on the digital side, right from the invention of the first computer to integrated circuits, to having a internet, to World Wide Web, and in 1995, Amazon there. So there was an ecosystem which was developing and touching many industries. But industries like Hollywood never wanted to release the blockbuster. And same as Michelin star restaurant never wanted to deliver at home. And health club never wanted to have a video online for health and fitness. Same was a pharma company. Pharma company thought that the patient has to come to the doctor and medical rep has to go to the doctor. Patient has to pick up the medicine from the nearby pharmacy to honor. And that was the conventional mode. It was, I would say, a safe mode in terms of which industry was running. It was running very well. But the times were not the same like World War I or influenza, where the normal changed. But after the pandemic, again, the normal came back because the ecosystem was not there. But today in India, when you had only a flat screen or the digital mobile, which were there only 10 million, 20 years back, and then it grew to some 100 million. And today we are talking about more half a billion. We are talking about health in a palm, and that's what is actually driving the entire healthcare change. So I would say this digital really realized us, the ecosystem which is developing on the infrastructure which is developing, and it can, it can come handy in terms of taking over the real physical world of healthcare which is there. And what Omar has enumerated, I would say that just before COVID, 
I actually looked at the data. There were 3.5 million prescription of the families which were using e-pharmacies, and it grew by 2.5 folds to 8.5 million. That is kind of a quantum jump, which has happened. We are talking about actually billions of you know tele consultations which are happening, and it is not happening alone. It is happening along with government of India. and i keep reiterating that just before the lockdown or probably on the day of the lockdown something which was there on the table for 3 to 4 years telemedicine guidelines were unfolded and were released on 23rd of march with the declaration of a lockdown yep. that was the impetus and again on the 15th of august prime minister modi talked about the digital health mission so that is the ecosystem which got developed and i think the pharma industry including us in novo nordisk we quickly realized that the denial mode is not something which we have to live in i think we have to embrace the technology and we have to accelerate faster to embrace the technology and see that how do we connect to the doctor and that's what we did we did hundreds of scientific platform to share the knowledge and information we tried connecting with the patients in terms of giving the right patient in education information and of course we collaborated with e pharmacy so that patients because of the logistics hurdle right in the beginning of the pandemic they don't get affected to ensure that medicine get delivered so i would say the ecosystem was there that got embraced because of the covid time was very ripe and i think probably very fast the healthcare or the pharmaceutical industry is walking the path which the other industries have all, already taken forward absolutely right yeah yeah thanks so much uh, vikrant for that uh, you know since you actually mentioned about uh, the policy side of it about being prepared about the guidelines that came on let telemedicines uh, though it's not uh, very closely related with uh, mr arvind kukreti's uh, domain area Uh, uh may i pose a question to him on exactly how things are changing at the government level i mean obviously you know uh, processes take time the government takes time to decide uh, and then you actually are in charge of the vaccine side in terms of uh, you know um, approving batches uh, of vaccines uh, where do you see uh, this kind of a uh, i mean has the pandemic really induced a sense of urgency in the way the government works uh, in terms of keeping the patient in your mind uh, you know as the central focus uh, what are the things that you probably have seen changing very quickly and what kind of a message does that have for the industry mr kukreti uh, sir you are on mute if you can unmute yourself yeah thank you for that question you know uh, being a regulator uh, we are responsible to safeguard and enhance public health and i think this is what is the motto of all the stakeholders which are involved in the healthcare sector apart from this if you see there were three things which were really asked by every stakeholders that is i say atp atp is not which is for the energy it is for accountability transparency and predictability these were the three things which were really asked for and this was realized by the government and our organization way back you know and we started looking for the solution and the solution was in technology only and the technology we thought that it is going to come when we become paperless so we started a journey in 2015 when everything you know we we we, we made a plan so that we can slowly get into a software based submission e applications e review and then uh, e approvals so uh, cdsu had uh, done a very good job if you see from 2015 16 to 2020 most of the work which is related to online application is being done on sugam sugam portal and uh, it has it has been a very good experience also for uh, the, not only for the regulator but also for the industry because the atp part is now actually there so now everybody knows that yes the application has gone it is not moving from table to table it is directly 
reaching to the reviewer viewer is making comments which are online and they are you know they are there in server for the whole life so you you get a sense that now it is basically the, the secure system is functioning where the companies are sure that their data is secure and it is being reviewed by the regulator to safeguard the public health and then now what we are doing is that we are also trying to make a national portal for this licensing system this is at an advanced stage and what is happening is that perhaps in few few months this is going to be rolled out and it becomes a uniform system of licensing for the whole country so this is what has been done you know as far as uh, the uh, regulation and uh, review and licensing system is concerned the important thing you know during this pand pandemic because it was unprecedented situation uh, there were different type of demands you know the uh, requirement changes because uh, the uh, when there was no uh, indication approved for the covid at the early stages there were you know uh, applications related to uh, additional users you know the additional indications so there is there, there was a so much uh, a uh, pressure on our organization to review things to, to to examine the claims and keeping that in view you know we have a subject expert uh, committees in our uh, headquarters where every proposal which is new is being examined by the expert committee and then uh, based on the consensus technical deliberations the uh, the pathway for the regular this uh, approval process uh, takes place so uh, if i tell you that during the la this this pandemic period there are around 430 uh, 430 to 450 uh, subject expert committees uh, meeting have held have been held and out of this there are around 140 for only covid type of drugs which include vaccines also and they all have been done through video conferencing where you know experts were involved it is a huge humongous task which has been taken uh, you know and i i appreciate you know i i congratulate all the people even the industry experts everybody who has come together in this difficult time and they have done uh, justice to see that you know whatever is being approved is not only as per the regulatory norms but it is safe efficacious and best for the people because it is being done in a shortest period of time so more effort has been put in so uh, So there is definitely a bigger change in the regulatory system. It is being improved day by day, and uh, the one thing which again has come up because of this COVID is that everybody, uh, every country wants to be self-reliant and be sustainable in their own own setup. So that is again which is pushing lot of push and pulls in the industry. It is going to pull put lot of push and pull, and a lot of price variations are going to. affect the industry so lot of things are being done by the government in that front also where we are not so uh, uh, you know we are more uh, dependent on import where we are trying to work upon so that we also cater to such needs in future thank you sure sure right right thanks so much for that uh, detailed outlook uh, in fact uh, you know you mentioned about push and pulls and uh, Uh, i remember 10th 11th of december i think pfizer's uh, pfizer biontech's uh, vaccine got the approval and then a week later again uh, the adcom in the us uh, met and gave the approval for moderna's vaccine and then there was a, a lot of uh, clamor about why are uh, indian regulators so slow finally the approvals came and it looked like you know a lot of uh, discussions have gone into it so yeah i mean we can actually uh, understand the kind of pressures that uh, regulators must have gone through so uh, yeah i mean i think uh, uh, that kind of uh, summed up very well on how geared up uh, is the regulatory system and uh, it will be challenged as we move ahead because uh, vaccines will be the the central focus for this year the way things are moving so uh yeah i think with that i i'll uh, move to uh, mr sanjeev navangul i mean he's uh, worked so closely with so many uh, you know companies uh, at uh, at the leadership level and uh, you know from him it will be very important to understand exactly how uh, is the industry coping with the challenges uh, you know having been at the at the forefront 
of uh, leading his company uh, you know mm, you know from the from the point of uh, uh, ensuring supplies are uh, not hampered because of the china issues uh, to the other end of research where he is actually working on a bunch of uh, repurposed uh, medicines so if you can give us a ring side view thanks vikas uh, so many friends here so uh, and some friends i have worked through like vikas the other vikas to try and see how organizations can change right now but i think uh, vikas, the biggest learning through the last about a year or so has been how to cut waste and how to learn new how to learn habits which we don't forget and that's probably the biggest uh, learning that we have had some things are of course uh, very uh, nostalgic uh, in 2010 uh, uh, many of you may not know but uh, there was a two member committee by ministry of health with me and rajendra gupta trying to see how to legalize e prescription and both of us wrote the report submitted to the ministry and then the at the meeting it was uh, just kept uh, in the uh, in, uh, away saying that are ye to kabhi nahi hona hai chhod do isko agar so <laughs> so after putting in a lot of effort the only response we ended up was with this and today when we look at everybody talking about growth of e prescription the e pharmacy and telemedicine i look back in at 10 years and say okay this was that was a time well spent in those times yeah but uh, coming to what has happened of late is i think many things are changing in terms of the way we are operating and habits are changing and i'll i'll tell you a series of habits that are changing in manufacturing people have learned the ability to ensure that they the uh, efficiency of the model is more dependent on how do we approach manufacturing and scheduling rather than just looking at efficiency in normal sense the uh, also looking at what technology interventions can be done in manufacturing to ensure that those changes happen if you look at site assessments vendor assessments are happening online international uh, regulators are operating on your plants they are doing site assessments based on online assessments and yeah. no longer travel is required and most of these habits are good habits which we should not change yeah. uh, the the other habit that we have seen changing is uh, doctors doctors are trying to engage more with telemedicine allowing companies also to interact on online basis imagine a rep who is to spend 8 hours in the field 7 hours traveling and parking his two wheeler and one hour meeting doctors yeah now the now the age old thing that i used to always say that rep productivity is one hour a day is really coming into play and now you can look at what the rep can do and do you need a rep or do you need a different kind of person now in the marketplace because if 8 hours a person can be productive then you might need a different skill set so those habits that we are learning we should not extinguish again you know i will not go back to the old world and really inventories i think uh, uh, again vikas can tell you that in earlier we used to be like cut to cut inventories very efficient inventories now we learn that inventory sometimes is power i remember scolding my inventory my procurement manager for having excess enoxaparin api in february to learning that that was part of gold i had when, when things changed so these the uh, regulators i think arvin uh, was absolutely right you know look at the accs subject expert committees were basically delhi expert committees because of travel issues yeah now it is really a subject expert committee because anywhere in the country national experts are able to participate because of digital technology even companies which used to company people used to spend hours waiting there in the office for their turn to come up now you are informed uh, 10 minutes in advance okay now is your presentation so you can do your day's work and still do your presentation so it so everywhere everywhere we started a every company every management started emergency response teams yeah now those teams are solving problems every day the situation has changed i have continued with that bt because i still find it very useful that in even if that 15 20 minutes 30 minutes in the morning the amount of issues that come up on the table and get solved are so many that this is a good habit and we should not give it away now uh, now the pandemic is uh, receding things are going okay uh, yeah. so that's so uh, every place if you see there is behavioral change that is happening and more importantly in r&d see ultimately if you want to do clinical research you require patients on clinical trials and if you hospitals are not working in the normal fashion 
if patients are not reaching hospitals so would only covid trials happen that is not a, that is not happened clinical trials have run in this country despite all this situation so we have found a way to do that the last thing i want to mention is that i think india has become very complacent in pharmaceutical industry on all our behavior whether it was r and d whether it was manufacturing whether it was digital uh, you know uh, acquiring digital habits at the front end everywhere we were becoming very very complacent this in fact the learning year or the year that we should remember and not forget has taught us a lot of things and look very quickly india has climbed up the ladder in terms of recognition globally in terms of r and d that we are now a nation to reckon with we have climbed the you know the value chain a little bit higher all of us as companies have delivered on that today my collaborations don't happen just in india i have a collaboration running with stanford i have a collaboration running with some other places many i have uh, you know uh, regulatory agencies all over the world which are working with me so much has changed because of the capability of r and d that we can generate so clearly the biggest change and i think vikas bhadoria can tell you n number of times the story companies have changed the way they work because the employees are also adapting to new behavior that is something which we should not change otherwise we'll slide back again very quickly so big change but more of important change is the behavioral change yeah i oh absolutely i mean it it's so wonderful to hear your thoughts i mean right from the uh, from the point that you mentioned about uh, telemedicines and uh, the next about the the complacence that had set in uh, for sure i mean because uh, had it not been for the pandemic people would not have actually thought so much more closely about doing fundamental research and uh, repurposed medicines i mean it's like a a a, a fresh uh, breeze uh, so to speak so uh, yeah I, i hopefully this will augur very well and as you rightly said i mean uh, once you'd mentioned to me about how the entire industry has actually reacted so strongly uh, with whatever they had in in terms of capabilities and you know in terms of uh, augmenting uh, augmenting research uh, this probably will be the the point of change uh, a, a, a real dramatic change so uh, uh, right so uh, we are Uh, we have about four or five speakers who have already uh, shared their thoughts and uh, um for uh, people who have logged in i must remind that there is a q and a box uh, in which they can actually post their questions and then we can take it uh, as we move along uh, one question that actually ties in well at this point is from uh, anup sharma and this is again something on which i was anyways going to come to uh, mr prashant nagre about uh, atmanirbharta and that's been one of the uh, important threads uh, in this entire pandemic because early stages in february march we started getting those uh, tremors about chinese uh, disrupting their uh, raw material supplies and even to date we are actually talking about uh, revamp of uh, uh, raw material supplies and plis and schemes like you know what can actually boost indigenous manufacturing so uh, the question actually is uh, head uh, he heads the quality at amnil we are discussing about atmanirbhar bharat and we are dependent on many countries for api and excipients is the government initiative in the right direction or when will we uh, become atmanirbhar so it's a kind of a blanket question but uh, uh, mr nagre you've got presence in antibiotics are you depending on chinese supplies do you have a robust plan in place to replace them steadily slowly stage wise any thoughts from you thank you vikas so i think i've got a very meaty question so i have to do justice to it i think this is um, uh, this is what has been the central point of all the debates in the last one year so i think i'll start very quickly at uh, is 100% atmanirbharta possible uh, in the entire active substances and that's a question and is that desirable uh, is that possible as well so uh, the answer is largely no okay so uh, uh, and the only strong argument for atmanirbharta as a concept would be uh, uh, in this day and age and i'm a student of uh, foreign trade so from right from michael porter to adam smith 
uh, I think uh, this, the entire wealth generation on this planet has happened because of globalization. So uh, when we trade into the waters of Atmanirbharta, it should be very carefully. And the only strong argument for that is security. And that is security under the times like this. And, uh, uh, and it is extremely essential to know that what would happen uh, to the antibiotics, that is the fundamental antibiotics from which multiple antibiotics are made is penicillin G. And do we make even one gram of that in this country? And we do not. And is that acceptable? And it is purely not. And do we create 100% of penicillin G consumption capabilities in India? The answer is again, no, but we need to have that. And I think here, one important thing that I want to bring out is we have to learn from the past. Uh, I was responsible for a plant which was close to Badoda and uh, that was a penicillin gene plant which was refurbished to do other things. Because in this country, we conveniently lost all the assets of critical strategic assets in the last 20, 30 years. And good old money was lost. Uh, and are we now repeating that mistake? Because I think there are two things and I'm very, very encouraged by the PLI scheme, because I think we are going in the right direction. So to answer to Anup, that is absolute brilliant thing that the government of India is doing, that it brought a focused attention to manufacturing capabilities in critical raw materials, which is critical starting materials, which are in other than the antibiotic space, antibiotics, as well as the drug intermediates, which are critical in chronic or otherwise acute therapies. So it is a very good thing. The drug, the bulk drug parks, because there are some synergies which will come out of it, those are also very welcome initiative. But is it enough? And I, I think that it is just a well beginning. It is a very good thought. However, you can't subsidize anyone. I mean, if, even if you have five years, you are giving people uh, incentives. Is that going to be enough uh, on the technological front? Because even in penicillin G, for example, we lost out because we were just not innovative enough. Our cost of production on this large scale fermentation or intermediates and scale plays a very important role. So when we are doing Atma Nirbharta, it also has a very direct correlation with the scale. Are you going to be in that scale where it becomes a sweet spot on unit cost? And that is very important. And the collaboration, therefore, the last part on this Atma Nirbharta is the innovative efforts. And they cannot be only domestic. They cannot be all within India. You need to collaborate with people around the world to choose and kind of bring in strains and probably it is the Silicon Valley way, the strain related kind of development on microorganisms is so well ahead of time that you need to collaborate and bring that back to this country or even for the neighbors for that matter. We, I do not know, but we may have to even collaborate with them to bring in the right kind of set. So having the unit kind of control on the unit cost will ultimately define this Atma Nirbharta story. If we do not have that under control through innovation, through all the uh, other controls on cost, then this does, this story doesn't run. The new money is also going to be wasted in five years time. So that is where I kind of lay my case on this. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Prasha. Actually, you mentioned it well about the loss of strategic assets over 30 years. And uh, I had also seen that happening slowly and steadily how actually, you know, something that was so robust and so competitive for us uh, in the late 90s, uh, we just uh, skidded down the slope. Uh, hopefully now, you know, from that 80% dependence on Chinese uh, supplies, uh, this also will trigger, let's see how it goes because, you know, uh, the 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 signals that I at least hear is that you know many of the companies which actually see that the rates falling from the Chinese suppliers have actually gone back uh, to procuring their goods their supplies from the Chinese. So it'll be a wait and watch kind of a thing. But on Atmanirbharta, I want to now uh, rope in uh, Anand and uh, dip into his uh, knowledge and thoughts about, you know, uh, remember the early stages when there were, uh, you know, issues with the testing kits and uh, we were actually not getting accurate results and the government ICMR decided to send back uh, lakhs of test kits that they actually procured from the Chinese. Uh, 
how did how did you see the entire uh, journey you know from that stage to india actually making diagnostic kits and now there is abundance of it and many companies many units got approved uh, your thoughts on that anand and is it like you know on many uh, territories uh, in many segments we do have competitiveness but it's actually come up now when the backs are to the wall thanks vikas uh, it's a very interesting question and uh, as we have always seen the medical devices as well as the in vitro diagnostics industry and the medical laboratory industry has been highly uh, dependent on imports you know for their uh, you know testing requirements whatever kits if you see almost 90% of the kits that we use in our labs are imported so that also determines you know what kind of pricing which we have for these tests but uh, you know as labs like us uh, srl diagnostics uh, we have been in the forefront of this covid war so to say from the start of the pandemic when the lockdown happened from the from that time you know uh, we had uh, about uh, we had only about two to three labs which had the capacity capacity and capability of doing rt pcr tests from there today in the last six months we have ramped up our capacity and we have about uh, 15 labs across the country which can do this covid rt pcr tests and we have done about close to 2 million uh, rt pcr tests in the last 6 months so that uh, that has been a possibility only because you know uh, one is you know a lot of uh, manufacturers have started doing their manufacturing in india and we have been able to uh, procure kits at a much better uh, rates compared to what it was earlier and a lot of indian companies have come up and created opportunities for uh, developing these kits in india itself and many foreign uh, companies have also decided to put in plants in india where they can start manufacturing locally so instead of just repacking and selling the same stuff so they have decided to manufacture a lot of things here and that also gives us a gives a boost to our r&d uh, you know activities so what we are seeing is that you know most of these new age uh, technologies that are going to be driven by uh, you know this uh, uh, biotech related uh, services so this is going to be highly dependent on r&d and uh, the kind of r&d that we have in our country uh, it has not been put to commercial use to the same extent to which you know uh, it has been done in the you know developed nations so that is probably one thing which will give a boost to our r&d activities and the industry academia collaboration uh, so that we are able to get reap better benefits out of it and even on the lab front uh, if you see in the us or in the uk you will find that almost uh, 30 to 40% of the tests which they do in the labs or in house developed tests they are called lab developed assays so in india currently that is not the trend so that is something which we are also um, talking about we are also collaborating with uh, players like mayo clinic laboratories in the us and trying to see how we can actually start developing tests in house so that you know we have less reliability on importing kits from abroad so these are some of the activities and just like how the earlier panelists talked about uh, you know how the pandemic fast track the digital transformation uh, in healthcare and in pharmaceuticals so similarly i feel that this atmanirbharta will also be you know fast track by this pandemic and it has brought the new realities in in front for us to look at right right yeah absolutely no uh, uh, you know one question that comes to mind is that you know uh, forget about the the inaccuracy of the results that came in it was all too rushed maybe it was not tested well i'm talking about the early early test kits that actually landed here uh, you know once once domestic production happened even the rates actually started falling uh, dramatically i mean from the time when companies were really not very happy even with 4500 rupees per test uh, now we are actually talking about um, somewhere around 1200 or even less than that so that also is a is a factor which actually plays very heavily in favor of uh, you know patients who will be using it because you know it suddenly becomes like five times lesser so did you see that kind of a trend happening in other tests as well or you see uh, because you know this will probably augur well for a lot of other places where it's not been tested so far yes generally if you see the indian uh, diagnostic tests uh, which are there most of the tests which are covered by the essential diagnostic list released by who yeah. you will find that india has uh, probably one fifth of the pricing that is there in the west so in terms of pricing we are already very competitive 
so if we are able to procure uh, these kits as a, at a better much better rates so probably we will we'll, we'll be able to even better the current rates and once given better volumes as well so that probably that kind of uh, thing will happen once there is better consolidation in the industry because that requires higher volumes for example if you take countries like the us probably there are only three or four large players who are uh, you know taking care of the diagnostic requirements of the country but here in india it's not like that so we have uh, uh, more than 100000 labs across the country and you know uh, there is unorganized sector huge unorganized sector there is no mandatory accreditation so the quality is not really you know monitored in the same way and the entry barriers are quite low so that probably also has uh, you know relevance to uh, how this entire uh, uh, price game will 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 be played let me come back to karan uh, you started with uh, your uh, nice little speech uh, and uh, you know from our uh, earlier interactions also uh, and from the competitiveness of uh, your own organization uh, you've been adapting technologies uh, pretty much in sync with uh, the other global players now that uh, you know this has been forced on us uh, or probably you know as uh, accelerate the pace of change do you think that you know indian industry as a whole will be able to jump uh, a few more hoops much faster in terms of the value chain in terms of uh, biosimilars in terms of overall research in terms of machine manufacturing do you think it kind of gives us a chance to really accelerate our ranking in the in the global healthcare industry i think most definitely vikas um if you really look at it at a very broad level um india has got a dearth of talent in it so if there were two industries which india is really famous for which are sort of the diamonds in the rough was pharmaceuticals and it um and and you know and, and today we see the number of graduates coming out of you know with it degrees and the number of new startups in the digital tech space it's it's enormous um and the wave of disruptions that are likely to happen in the upcoming mm-hmm. next i would say a few years is in my in my opinion unprecedented that you're going to see within india now other countries unfortunately don't have the same dearth of you know these young sort of the you know this young audience these young it professionals the way india does now when you merge the two you're talking digital which is you know the fundamentals are, are, are purely it driven when you merge that along with healthcare i can i can tell you that you you're going to see companies doing things which in the west probably would cost them millions if not billions of dollars to do and we can do it at a fraction of the cost that's mm-hmm. going to accelerate change and disruption at an enormous level um and you know and what i see at least with some of the initiatives taken by the government india becoming the pharmacy of the world and driving digital tech in a way that it's never been seen before our population is 1.3 1.4 billion people to take care of the health and well-being of 1.4 billion people can't be done in a traditional way it has to be looked at differently and you got to deploy some of these technologies in order to reach to all those 1.4 billion people efficiently otherwise we're going to leave a large part of the population out so so you know i think i think we we're beginning to see the benefits that digital technologies can bring about not only at a at a at a at let's say at the manufacturing level which is what we see but also i think at the consumer level um and and some of the changes that that have already occurred with its telemedicine you know someone sitting in a rural village today with a smartphone can actually access some of the best doctors across india if he needs any care in a, any specific area that was not possible earlier um i know people you know people staff that work in the cities that went back and they have to travel almost hours to get to a hospital for some basic help that they may need so i think i think there is a there is this huge shift i think india is well positioned for it i think we've got um i think current frame actually froze these technologies are here to okay. stay hopefully and sajeev talked about it as well he said some of these behavioral changes i think they're good so okay. if they, if they remain and if they stay uh i think india's got a really bright future great yeah 
yeah hopefully we'll move in that direction and uh, you know this is a, a massive opportunity for collaboration between the regulators the industry uh, one question that actually gives me a very nice ground to put across uh, to most of you uh, you can go on this about uh, this is from pankaj shrivastava considering that uh, hospital access is becoming a huge challenge and thus meeting doctors in the usual manner is not possible what model the group will suggest other than digital interaction uh, mr navangul sir you want to go first on this <laughs> look uh, because i think i have a very maybe controversial answer to this is uh, the very reason that reps is to meet doctors needs to be questioned <laughs> yeah and whether it is digital or digital or that tell first we need to understand why are reps meeting doctors doctors used to feel pampered the reps used to feel happy and whether it was productive or not that was never checked what this is forcing us to see is that is there a productive engagement that is happening between the organization and the medical fraternity absolutely and that is important so it's not about the meeting of doctors by reps that we should look only and fully concentrate on we should start concentrating on the aspect that how can it be more enriching for both and therefore both are on the same side of the table to ensure that the quality of treatment given to the patient improves dramatically and that interaction is more important so i am probably on some other planet on this issue that i am starting to question that are we now are really now ready to understand why do these two meet or why organizations and medical fraternity meet if we solve that it doesn't matter whether it is digital this you know it, it real medium matters less digital gives you an opportunity to organize things in a much better way second the meeting between the doctors and the organization need not be basically a product promotion exercise alone yeah. but can be really a more uh, stakeholder driven that suppose we are discussing like you know omar as and uh, and uh, Uh, vikrant would agree that if if we are discussing about patient outcomes in diabetes i would rather have a nutritionist along with me or an uh, somebody who's uh, able to explain physical activity along with me when we call on the doctor to explain these type of patients we need to do these kinds of things so the interaction has to change so i am not so much concerned about how the medium is being used but what is it used for yeah yeah totally i think you know what i i i'll i'll definitely want to hear more thoughts on this because it's uh, it's as you rightly said it's controversial and it's very interesting and it's been one of my favorite topics also but we'll because there are so many important points to be touched upon uh, one which actually came to uh, for for from most of the speakers was about the kind of convergence that we are seeing on issues such as nutraceuticals uh you know it's not been so well discussed before but i don't know i mean now it's actually coming up uh, pretty often in our discussions do you think the shape of the healthcare sector will change in such a way that you know we saw just recently two big ceos one of, one from fmcg and the other from a pharma company actually discussing do you think that that's probably the start of where things are headed and uh, i'd not have anyone better than uh, vikas to speak on this where exactly is the industry headed do you think it will become more healthcare wellness oriented from here on is that something that you see um, as a contour so oh, absolutely i think it again needed a, a big jolt like this for patients to start thinking differently right and i think having gone through this experience i think suddenly the importance of a uh, prevention the importance of wellness the importance of immunity has gone up right people have dramatically kind of you know it's become center stage of conversation suddenly and i think this is the time when the industry right when the industry can really double down on the momentum and help people move in that direction right i mean having said all of this still if you look at availability of products and you look at the availability of solutions in the market space i would say it is not yet at a level where the market can fully explode and to me i think this is now really not with the patients this is now with the industry and this is now with the stakeholders to actually shape this ecosystem and really give patients compelling propositions that really drive the growth of this sector but to me i am 
extremely bullish about the opportunity here. And honestly, this is the right direction to go. Even if you go back to Karun's point about 1.3, 1.4 billion people, I mean, one solution to that is prevention. Because once you get to treatment, it's already too late. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, there hasn't been a, a, a bigger opportunity for immunity boosters to actually sell, uh, you know, it to, I don't know, I mean, uh, whether the science or the evidence part of it is very well understood on exactly what really creates immunity. That's a big question mark. But yes, I mean, the sales of products have actually gone up. So somehow the virus has made people think that, okay, you know, you need to be internally strong to beat it. So, um, any, any, anyone else I would like to understand any, uh, 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 yeah, okay, Ms. Prashant raises his hand. Yes, go ahead. Sir. Uh, I, I thank you so much because I, I was uh, wanting, I was very eager to talk on this subject because I think the last thing that you said, uh, where is the evidence, okay? Um, uh, so, what is happening is awareness, how nutraceutical function, we as a company uh, deal with about 85% exports and we deal with the western world where vitamins go, we do large vitamins, large portion of one vitamin, fat soluble. And we have seen that the awareness level in the western world is at a very different level. So, there is no engagement of physician there when people uh, do the preventive part. And uh, in India, I see two trends, and I completely agree with Vikas uh, uh, Badoria ji, that it is going to change. Now, it is not the, the patients, it is not the consumers, I think it is the industry, uh, which has to take and build on that awareness, accessibility, and the affordability of this, because currently it is not in a mass segment, it is very premiumly priced. So it is actually completely priced outside the general population. The, yeah. the kind of sophisticated uh, stuff which are available. That is one part of it. Uh, we did see that we did so, uh, see that there were so many options given to patients in India to build immunity. And where is the evidence of that? And I think that's where industry has to step in. Ingredients with stories, ingredients with uh, available evidence, which is acceptable because a large portion of this in India will be run by even now also and even in future will be run through physicians and the nutritionists. They will still prescribe these nutraceuticals to people. And that is how, because we go to our general practitioner, we ask him what is good because we don't, largely population suddenly will not know what to take, how many times to take, what doses to take, when to stop, when to restart and all of that. Okay, so that is not going to happen. So the physician will play a very important role and physicians are very doubtful. There is a factor yeah. of trust missing on the nutraceuticals. And that has to be black. One good thing which has happened, last point, is FSCCI. It has got a claims. And now the claims which can be put on the product is a science which is very well developed with the guarantee. Evidence needs to be generated by the industry. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, you uh, you made my task easy. I was actually going to ask about the the the... The quality standards, uh, you know, when it comes to nutraceuticals, you have like a very um, mass, uh, you know, uh, claims that are made uh, from uh, various scrupulous, uh, unscrupulous, both uh, sides of the business. In this, uh, maybe I can pick the brains of uh, Mr. Kukreti, you know, as a regulator, uh, what do you think about the shape of the regulations? Do you think uh, it requires a very robust uh, scrutiny mechanism in terms of approvals? How do you want to make it, uh, you know, uh, the trust factor, bring in the trust factor as uh, Prashant Nagri was mentioned? Uh, yeah, actually, you know, uh, during COVID, the food, fooding habits, they have, you know, changed a bit. And you know that India being a, a country where a lot of uh, uh, food art articles are being used as medicine. So it became very, very important for every uh, person in the country to change a little bit. You know, we know, we all know about haldi, but now if you ask a common man, he will tell you about curcumin. So yeah. What is happening is that the, there is a little bit shift in everybody's mind that there is a science which is working in these all foods, which is basically helping you to build your, uh, you know, immunity or build your stamina or build you 
to fight the disease you know this is what is basically imbibing into larger uh, uh, population of society in our country this is what uh, is important now when we talk about claims there are regulations which basically uh, looks after what exactly is being claimed uh, if you see the nutraceuticals it it is basically you know earlier uh, it was totally falling you know within the definition of drug there was there is schedule v in drugs and cosmetic act which talks about the quantum of drugs with you know vitamins or other things which you can use and it becomes in the category of drug then when when this food safety authority of india this act came then there is another definition of uh, you know nutraceuticals so now the, the the clear definition has come up and things are being segregated that what will become a drug and what will become a nutraceutical so once the nutraceutical is there there is a well defined act where you have to prove about your claims and there is a standard for it because food food act also provides the standard similarly the drug act also provides the standard so what we are seeing is that there is a ample provision within the statute to have the control on those things uh now you know one thing which i was reading recently what i foresee is that recently uh, there was some news in the uh, uh, some newspaper where it says that uh, hyderabad farmer has won a patent for vitamin d enriched rice and wheat so this is something which is very encouraging you know i am a regulator i don't have anything to do with farming but what i see in this is that there is a trend perhaps which is going on with the scientists that let us do something where we can have nutraceuticals within the food if this happens i think this is going to revolutionize the whole system of uh, you know taking uh, nutraceuticals in future absolutely yeah yeah actually you know when you mention about uh, the segregation of drugs versus nutraceuticals and then the the kind of changes that you are actually seeing in terms of uh nutrition laced uh, products uh, the fortification side of it i think you know it it definitely creates uh, a lot of confidence in the minds of people um i think very quickly we actually uh, finished an hour and uh, didn't realize so and uh, i think uh, uh, touched upon uh, a lot of crucial issues right from the manufacturing side to online prescriptions to telemedicines and how the industry should uh, handle uh, shortages uh, right up to uh, nutraceuticals i would like to uh, you know management consultants are known to be good uh, in terms of articulation and sum up well so i would not do that i would because vikas is there i would like him to take the center stage and tell us exactly what should be the few key points first from the uh, industry and how they can become relevant really relevant to the patients so well, thank you uh, thank you vikas for that opportunity i'll try my best to sum up what we all covered over the last one hour but i think uh, i would want to start off by saying that the pandemic actually led all of us individually and collectively as organizations regulators to kind of re question our operating model and our practices right and i think we all innovated and we all found grounds that we would not have otherwise and i think the real thing here is what sanjeev articulated post that which is how do we ensure that the good habits now stick right we have seen some of these things work how do we ensure that we don't call it back to our comfort zones and we kind of you know retain this i think from a um, from a, um, a, a preventive standpoint we talked a lot about how you know given the burden of population that we have as a country our uh, current very articulately men- mentioned that we can't go with the same old approach to um managing disease managing health in this country as many other countries can right and therefore how do we actually think about it comprehensively not just treatment but starting from prevention and wellness and how do we then actually think about technology i mean the real disruption that we have available to us as a country is affordable technology 
how do we kind of marry those two, right? I mean, uh, Arvind very, very beautifully summarized how the regulatory framework was able to adopt technology so quickly, and that has improved the quality of outcomes, right? So I think for me, the answer lies in kind of, you know, building on the gains made during this period, forming habits, questioning some of the things that we are doing, right? The black box of the sort of, you know, the, the rep interacting with the HCPs. What is really there? Can you break it down? And can you make it into specialized activities that can be done by specialized people? And then leverage technology across the entire continuum to ensure that we are not just self-reliant, self-reliant in a responsible and a feasible way, but also sort of focusing on bringing in science and bringing in claims uh, into the wellness as well as the prevention uh, part of the ecosystem. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, that's a brilliant sum up. Um, so with that, I would uh, like, uh, you know, because we have a little more luxury of time, we can have one one line each from each of you on what could be your key messages. So I would go with my screen where uh, on my right is Anand and then we can go to Prashant and then Omar and uh, Vikas uh, did his uh, job so well. So we will skip him and then we'll go to Karan and so on. So Anand, if you can uh, start with a very crisp one or two lines. Thanks. Thanks, Vikas. Uh, I think uh, this pandemic has brought out a lot of opportunities for the healthcare and pharmaceutical industry. And especially if you talk about uh, diagnostics, I think the digital transformation that has been fast-tracked is one of the key elements. And also the fact that we have been able to provide services across uh, all sectors or across all geographies in a much better way compared to before. And Sorry. the change in co consumer behavior, that's another very critical aspect where consumer wants more safe and hygienic blood collection. So they have started using more of home collection services where they now prefer to be getting their test done from home. And the way they have used digital platforms, like, you know, may, whether it is for making payments or whether it is for accessing reports, or whether it is for booking a test. So they have right. started digital platforms. So there is a big uh, change. And I think these uh, changes which have happened will continue and uh, it will fast track our digital transformation and the overall healthcare industry will improve based on these changes. Right. So again, I mean, it ties with what Vikas mentioned about good habits and not to go back to the old system because it's actually created a new template. So thanks for that. Uh, Prashant, your thoughts in a very quick way. Yeah. Yeah. So quickly, um, uh, drawing attention from a uh, completely different uh, starting place now. Uh, uh, COVID, in my opinion, is going to be endemic. It will be always there in one pocket somewhere around the corner because uh, not all the medium and low income countries and not all young, the young people or otherwise people who are vaccine for will take this. So it is going to be in circulation. I think what all of us have to build is capabilities, capacities within our systems in every single aspect uh, to continue to have a very, very long drawn fight against this particular thing within our organizations. And last is, I completely agree with Sanjeev, the behavioral part of it. I think whatever we have learned, this is a shock therapy, the COVID for last one year has been. And we just cannot afford to forget anything that we have been taught now. Uh, so that is where I lay my thoughts. Right, right, right. Thanks, Prashant. Okay, Omar, uh, you go next The from shock therapy. Uh, Omar, uh, your turn now. Sorry, you can hear me now? Sorry, yep. there was Absolutely. a connectivity issue. Yep. All right. Uh, just very quickly, because we spoke about telehealth and Un spoke about home care. I think with all the digital approaches that we will see going forward, it, it is going to be something like an integrated personalized therapy management going forward, where uh, companies like us would like to enable patients to master the complexity of managing their situation to improve uh, their, their condition. Um, and it will be more outcome driven is what I think. Thank you very much, Vikas. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, Vikrant, your turn now. For me, digital change is here. And I will just twist it around inwards to the organization. In my organization, one very important thing is, is there a simplified or a digital way to do the things conventionally, which we have not been doing. And the element attached to it is 
digital literacy and the speed of learning the new technology or the way to do things much more easier has to be accelerated very fast very fast and they are changing so dramatically that one has to up the sleeve in terms of keeping the pace and learning newer ways to do the things got it got it yep absolutely uh, mr navangul your turn sir so two quick ones one is uh, don't just respond learn to be prepared and mm. the second thing i would say is take vaccination seriously take adult vaccination even more seriously i can give you examples of pneumococcal vaccine uh, herpes zoster hpv uh, all kinds of adult vaccination take them seriously absolutely oh that was really nice short really thanks nice. so much uh, uh uh karan your turn i believe this pandemic has has led to a lot of disruption but at the same time a lot of opportunity and i think those of us that choose to embrace those opportunities i think we can look forward to a a, a really bright horizon ahead of us um from my side i always try and make it better and 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 hopefully i keep you know people within the organization continue doing that and each one of you find a way to make it better for yourself too thank you brilliant absolutely the key is in the hand of the regulator always mr kukrete your turn sir i, I you are on mute boss so what i get from this discussion is that behavioral upkeep is something which is very very important to deal with the, the pandemic and the best use of technology to enhance and safeguard public health this is what i think is the liner from my side right anything on vaccines we i mean no discussion is complete without a little stress on vaccines everyone is discussing vaccines it's on front pages everywhere yeah see the, what what um, sanjeev has said is true that everybody should get the vaccine as he gets the chance to uh, first chance to get it because vaccination is going to give you the best uh, you know prevention the uh, what what we say is the evidence based prevention which against that particular disease so this is what is very important to understand that when we want to be you know protected against covid the first thing which is well known is the vaccine so if i get a chance take the vaccine and then encourage people to have vaccine absolutely yeah and how that sector actually emerged from nowhere i mean no one was wanting to be in vaccines and we saw so many deals actually people hiving off vaccines so we can so, actually you know if you see the whole vaccine industry we have uh, in himachal only we have you know fast this uh, cri you know central research institute is a 100 year old institute if you see the maximum number of vaccine manufacturers in the country most of the people have called you know from cri has contributed to these institute so we have around 21 vaccine manufacturer in india and if you see most of the uh, you know nations outside india there will be one or two vaccine manufacturer in that country we have the largest vaccine manufacturer in india every third child in the world gets vaccine from india so ultimately we we had that uh, you know set up since so long but only thing is that now we have Uh, reach the level where we are producing now the niche vaccines. Those who are not produced anywhere, we have started making those vaccines, and we have done very good uh, as a nation to uh, you know come up with the COVID vaccine in a very very short competitive time. If you see the whole world, so that is where this this is coming up, and uh, you know uh, your yeah. Research, yeah where is where are the manufacturers? We have around say fourteen thousand manufacturers of pharmaceutical in the country and we have only 21 for the vaccine so it is a very niche highly technology driven uh, you know sector where people have to come uh, with lot of uh, technology uh, you know people uh, the patients in mind because vaccine is going to take long time to come up in, in the market so the gestation period is too long for such such product yeah i mean absolutely i mean that sector was uh, never in focus and now it's like everyone is talking about it and yeah it's so exciting i mean the way we actually changed overnight nearly in in one year we are discussing so many different things 
so thank you so much i think you know this is one of the most wonderful panels uh, you know i have uh, moderated uh, with so many representations and it is said that you know if the panelists are good you you can't have enough time i mean this can discussion can go on for 3 4 hours more uh, but due to the constraints uh, we'll have to wrap it up here thanks so much for all your views very uh, diverse views and uh, look forward to more uh, thought processes from all of you at different stages so uh, thanks again for uh, being present here and thanks attendees also for being there uh, with that i'd uh, like to hand over to rai kishori for the conclusions well thank you vikas and thank you gentlemen for such an illuminative session and i hope we do hope that it has been a useful time spent with us and so on behalf of economic times i would like to thank each one of you our speakers our audience for sharing such thoughtful insights with us and we hope it has been a useful time for everyone so hope to see you soon in our next editions till then stay safe stay happy <laughs>